Good morning, it's me, Kenny Polkari, and today is Monday, April 15th, tax day here in the United States. Uh, and here are the things you need to go know because there's a whole lot going on besides me going all Tommy Bahama this morning. So here's what you need to know. On Friday, we saw the markets retreat fairly substantially on all the geopolitical angst that had been building uh, during the day and into the weekend, right? The banks began the beauty pageant. Investors, as usual, they take profits, even on better than expected reports. Israel, over the weekend on Saturday, shot down 300 plus Iranian missiles and drones uh, on Saturday evening. And markets around the world this morning are all trading higher on the back of that news. And what are we having tonight? We're going to have the slow roasted sirloin. Mm, easy to make and so delicious. So on Friday, stocks could hit hard. The VIX surged by 16% as the geopolitical risks rose, right? Think the whole Israel Iran uh, conflict, right? Investors, traders, and algos taking chips off the table ahead of what was expected to be an anxious weekend. In addition, it was the start of earnings season, and while J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, and Citibank all reported better than expected results on both the top and bottom lines, uh, and all supported each other, saying that the U.S. economy and U.S. consumer are in healthy condition, they warned that their net is interest income, right, they think their core lending income, uh, is going to come under pressure and will be muted this year as they are forced to pay higher rates on deposits, right? So think no rate cuts coming anytime soon, and that is key. No rate cuts coming anytime soon. We've been talking about it. Well, now it's, uh, you know, they're hammering it into our heads. Now, look. These stocks, the bank stocks, appeared to be under pressure in the pre-market even before they reported their results. And to that, I would argue that the group, the XLF, was up nearly 8% coming into Friday. JP Morgan up 15%, Citibank up 17%, Wells Fargo up 15%. Right, They were primed for some profit-taking, and we always see this pattern hold true with the banks every earnings season. They take them up in the weeks ahead, and then they hit the sell button on earnings day, and they lock in these profits and take some money off the table. I, per I mean, J.P. Morgan got hit by 6%, which I personally think was way overdone. But to some people, I guess it made some sense, right? The stock is up 45% off the October low. It's up 15% this, day, year, uh, this year alone. Citibank's up, uh, Citibank lost 1.7%. Wells Fargo lost just three tenths of a percent, right? So JP Morgan got hit hard. The action helped to drag down the whole sector. Anything in financial services got whacked, right? The big banks, like I said, JP Morgan, Citibank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, uh, Goldman Sachs all got hit. The regional banks, Truist Financial, PNC, Regions Financial, First Citizens, and Key Bank all got hit. The small banks, New York Community Bank, CBU, uh, Fulton Financial, and WBS all got hit. And even the investment managers got whacked, right? BlackRock, T. Rowe, uh, um, uh, Ben, and uh, uh, AMG, right? All came under pressure. In fact, it was the action in the financial banking sector, coupled with the anxiety surrounding the Middle East, that sent some to run for the exits. At the end of the day, the Dow lost 475 points or one and a quarter. The SP down 75 points or one and a half. The NASDAQ gave back 265 points or 1.6%. The Russell lost 40 points or 2%. Uh, Transports gave back 250 points or 1.6%, while the equal weighted S&P gave up 106 points or one and a half percent. Now, in addition to the bank drama, the world braced for a well-publicized response from Iran against Israel for the attack on the Iranian consulate in Syria last week. And what some suggest is Iranian soil, right? The consulate on the Syrian uh, uh, country isn't really Iranian soil. So the markets braced for what they weren't sure was going to happen. Jojo and Anthony Blinken and the F Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin all telling us all day that they warned Iran to take a breath. Don't go there, they said. While at the same time, they told us that a response is in the works and the world should brace for it and that the U.S. was solidly in Israel's court. Kind of like when they told us that uh, they told Putin not to invade Ukraine and the U.S. was solidly in Ukraine's court and then Putin invaded Ukraine. And just wait till Xi Xi attempts to take Taiwan because over the weekend when, he had, when asked, Jojo once again told us that the U.S. is solidly in Taiwan's court. Now, does anyone see a pattern here? Jojo warns these guys not to do it and then they go out and do it. I don't know, it's just food for thought, right? In any event, this is now the world that we live in, at least for today. 
And on Saturday evening, like I said, Iran launched some 300 plus drones and missiles into Israel directly from Iranian, so directly from Tehran, not from their proxies. But the Iron Dome knocked out 99% of them right in the air, leaving little to no damage or deaths in Israel. Some suggesting that it cost Israel more than a billion dollars to defend itself against this attack, multiple times greater than what it cost Iran to send all these missiles into, the, into that area, into that zone, right? And for this reason alone, my sense is that the aerospace and defense industry is going to see a fair amount of action today and going forward, right? Think the XAR, the ITA, those are both aerospace and defense ETFs which actually have been underperforming this year. Uh, XAR is up 1%, the ITA is uh, down 8 tenths of a percent. Some individual names though have been performing better. Raytheon's up 18% year to date, Curtis Wright up 12%, Gerald Dynamics up 11%. Others not so much. Lockheed Martin is down 6 tenths and Northrop Grumman down 2.5%. So I think there is opportunity there, just that you gotta kind of search it out. Now the Mideast is now even more of a tinderbox. Ready to explode at any moment, Israel has vowed to respond. Nasser Imani, an Iranian analyst, put it this way. Iran's operations has sent a crystal clear message to Israel and its allies that the rules of the game have now changed. If Israel strikes any Iranian target or kills any Iranian, we, we are willing to strike in a big way from our own soil. Do not expect this issue to go away anytime soon. So it's adding, so maybe adding some of the contra trades uh, to your portfolio might help. And it did help to mute some of the sell off, and it might in the future if you're worried about it. The VIX, which is the fear index, surged by 16% on Friday. It's up 50% since late March. The VIXI ETF rose by 8%. Now that's up 18% since March. And this makes perfect sense. It is a fear index. And when the fear rises, the VIX rises. Recall that the VIX has been hovering between 12 and a half and 14 and a half for weeks now, right? Historically kind of in a complacent range, but it was the breakout in early April above the 14 and a half range amidst the fear over earnings and the fear over the risks in the middies that set the market up for its recent retreat. As expected, the other contra trades on Friday were up as well. So think the dog was up 1.3%, the SH up 1.5%, the PSQ was up 1.7%, and all those three are up on the year as well. I suspect that we're going to see lots of volatility in the days ahead. So these, uh, I would expect these contra trades to act well. Bonds, which have been under pressure, rallied a bit on Friday. The TLT up a half a percent, the TLH up a half a percent, not doing much for yields. Oil, which has rallied significantly, seems to be in a holding pattern right now, trading at 84.90. This after trading as high as 87.70 on Friday, ahead of the expected response, before closing at 85.66. Now, the unrest in the Mideast now will now be the driver for oil prices, at least in the short term, for the foreseeable future. The idea that there was not more damage or fallout over the weekend is giving some uh, relief to the oil markets this morning and the equity markets across the board. My sense is that oil remains on an upward trajectory anyway, and any further angst out of the middies could see oil top $90 a barrel. Gold surged up and through 2400 on Friday morning, trading as high as 2448 on the back of that geopolitical anxiety and what was viewed as the ultimate flight to safety. But by the end of the day, gold came in and closed at 2375. This morning it's trading down seven bucks at like 2368 ish for all those same reasons, right? But if the tensions heat up again, then expect gold to rally. But as long as they come down, gold may, uh, may just retreat a little bit. Now this morning, US futures are up. Dow up 100, SP's up 22, NASDAQ up 100, and the Russell's ahead by three. The idea that there was not more fallout over the weekend and that many are now speculating that diplomatic efforts will prevent the most recent conflict from escalating is helping the overall tone. Over the weekend at the emergency UN Security Council meeting, the, Iran the Iranians supposedly told the UN that the issue can be deemed concluded now. The U.S. and other nations are calling on Netanyahu to rethink his response in order to not escalate the tensions in the region, creating uh, an all-out regional war, right? Something nobody wants to see. Ecodata today includes the Empire Manufacturing down five, retail sales of plus four tenths, X autos and gas of up three tenths. Later in the week, we're going to get housing data. Uh, housing starts, building permits, industrial production, capacity utilization, the Fed's beige book, existing home sales, and the Philly Fed business outlook. Earnings today include Goldman Sachs. They had a double B. 
Both the top and bottom lines are up 3.5% this morning. We're also going to get M&T Bank and Charlie Schwab. The S&P closed at 51.23 on Friday, down 75 points after testing as low as 51.07. A level I identified last week as a level that uh, would offer some support to the markets. This morning's future suggests a bit of a rally, mostly because of the muted geopolitical events and not because of earnings. It feels like the algos want uh, a broad rally after we saw that broad sell-off on Friday, and we'll probably get that kind of uh, boomerang reaction. I expect all kinds of chatter today about what took place over the weekend and what elected officials and the market may even speculate what may happen next. My sense is that we're in this 5,100, 5,200 trading range. Apple in the news again. Chinese competitor shipments apparently on the rise. Okay, so Apple shipped 50.1 million units versus 55.4, down nine, a little over 9%. Chinese companies, Xiaomi and Transition, both making comebacks. But I'd like to know who's really buying Chinese phones. Are you? Because I'm not. Americans are not buying Chinese phones, I can imagine. But I imagine the Chinese, the Iranians, and the Russians are. Remember, Apple is more than just about iPhones. Uh, and while it's under pressure this morning, it's down 1%, I'm not changing my investment thesis on this headline at all, nor, like I said, am I buying a Chinese phone or even a Chinese car for that matter. But that's me. You make up your own mind. Earnings in Apple are due out on May 2nd. Now, as suspected, the market has sold off about 2.75% from the highs. Some individual names have gotten beaten up a little, more, a little bit more. But remember what I told you on Friday. I would love to see us shake the branches a bit more, thinking like down 8 to 10% in the broad market, which would take us back to the 4,800, 4,800 range. But while I would like to see that, I do not think we're going to see that. The buy, the dippers are too anxious. 5,100 seems to be the short-term trend line, and look what we did. Uh, 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 we tested it, and we held, and now we're bouncing off of that, uh, and we'll see what happens today. Uh, but I suspect we'll test it again fairly soon. Um, now, unless we get some updated, heated rhetoric out of the Mideast, I suspect we'll get that boomer rally, at least for today. The market appears to have accepted the narrative that we're not getting any rate cuts anytime in the near future. So the focus is going to try to turn to earnings, but uh, will be overshadowed, certainly, by these global political drama, right? Remember, the geopolitical drama creates short-term angst and opportunity, but doesn't usually price stocks in the long term. So be strategic with your money and look for those opportunities. Okay, so what do we have for dinner tonight? So this is a great dish, but you need some time, right? It's a slow roasted sirloin roast, right? It's, it's, it's not that difficult, but I'm going to tell you how to do it. You want to get a nice sirloin roast, maybe five or six pounds. Season it with salt uh, and pepper and let it, let it rest for 20 minutes on the counter. While it's resting, you want to slice mushrooms, uh, chop two large carrots, two large celery ribs, one large onion, a uh, and uh, you want to have a can of low-sodium beef broth and a can of tomato paste ready uh, for when you need it. Also, you're going to select kind of a nice bottle of red wine. Not, not a super expensive one, but maybe a nice Cabernet. Now, after resting, you're going to, see, you're going to, after resting, you're going to sear the beef. Uh, in a frying pan with olive oil, making sure to brown it on all sides, even allowing, you know, like a crust to form. When it's complete, you're going to put it in a V-rack in a roasting pan and place it in a preheated 275 degree oven uncovered. It's got to cook for two and a half to three hours or ready when your thermometer tells you it's ready, right? After putting the roast in the oven, though, go back to the frying pan. Add the chopped veggies to the oil, saute them until they're tender, eight to 10 minutes. Add the tomato paste and mix it around. Then add like half a bottle maybe of the red wine and stir. Bring it to a boil, let the alcohol burn off, right? Three or four minutes. Now add the beef broth and simmer, stirring this occasionally. Don't let it dry out. If necessary, you can always add more broth, right? Because you don't want it to be dry. You need the juice. After about 10 minutes, taste to make sure you like it. If so, puree half of this mixture and then return it to the saute pan and turn it off until you need it. When the beef is ready, take it out of the oven and let it rest for uh, 10 minutes. Cover it in foil to keep it warm. Reheat the sauce, thinly slice the roast, and arrange it on the plate. Top now each you know, plate with the sauce. Serve this with mashed potatoes and maybe saute uh, peas. Uh, always having a large green, a large mixed green salad. And then, of course, 
don't forget the wine. You can use the one you use to cook with if you like it. Um, if you want something different, then go for something different. In any event, it's going to be a gorgeous day here today. It's going to be in the mid-80s, probably about 85, sunny and beautiful out. Until tomorrow, take good care.